Welcome to Theory Neutral, the podcast about stuff languages do. I'm Jacob. I'm Aiden. I'm Logan, and today we are talking about the paper Nominal Word Order Typology in Signed Languages by Katie Coons, a PhD student at UT Austin. Who is here with us today on the podcast. Hello. Hello. It's wonderful to be here. So, Katie, who are you and what's your research, basically? Can you introduce yourself a bit and, you know, so that our listeners know who you are, what you're doing and your research? Because I think they will be quite interested. Yeah, so... I'm Katie. I'm a PhD student at UT Austin, and I've been studying sign languages for a few years now. My research mostly looks at Mexican sign language and American sign language, and their noun structures and what happens in contact. Uh, this paper is a little bit of a fallout of that research, and I'm really excited to talk about it today. Cool. We're excited to have you. So my impression as a person who got a master's degree studying linguistics at one point uh, is that sign languages are severely understudied relative to uh, acoustic languages, which is a term I am making up because I have never come across a really great way to refer to languages that are not signed that doesn't feel like super prejudiced in some way. Um, so, you know, what I'm speaking right now is a language that is communicated through the acoustic medium. So I'm going to call it an acoustic language because it's not using signs and it's using acoustics. Um, but anyway, it is, it is simultaneously obvious to me that the medium in which a language is communicated has a significant impact on linguistic structure. Most obviously, sign languages can use 3D space, and they do use 3D space, while acoustic languages can't and therefore don't. But it is entirely possible that there are less obvious influences of the medium of communication on structure, and so we should be doing typology on languages in different mediums to figure out what those are. And that's one of the reasons that I was super interested in reviewing this paper. Yeah, also another aspect why we, I think, I think I can speak for all of us here, wanted to do something about sign languages is that they, not only that uh, the medium is completely different, as Logan just said, but also that it's like severely understudied, especially from our perspective of naive acoustic language linguists. Because, you know, if you always just talk about typology of uh, acoustic languages and uh, just don't have this uh, sign language typology thing within your uh, perimeter, you know, within your reach, within your, yeah, within your sight, you know, uh, then obviously it isn't as present, as salient to you. But that's why we want to talk about it, because we want to give some attention to that part of linguistics, that part of typology. Yep. So before we get into the actual typological data, there are some aspects of the paper that make me very happy <laughs> um, in terms of references and structure. First, it's worth mentioning, this is a podcast. This is an audio medium. We are talking about languages that don't use an audio medium. So it's going to be a little bit awkward to try and maybe give actual examples. Yes. But we're going to try and do our best because this is just a weird way to do it. But oh well. That's how podcasts work. I have a question on that because I was wondering, for example, at conferences, you know, uh, sign language conferences, how do you, do you assign the signs or do you, like, do you say the glosses or how do you, how do you handle that? Just as a side question. This is really relevant because a very large uh, international conference on sign languages is about to happen this month. So it depends on the modality that you're presenting in, but Generally, both if you're using a spoken language to present, but for example, I will be presenting some data on person marking in Mexican Sign Language uh, in a few weeks, and I have videos that I'm planning to show, and they have a gloss, which is less than ideal, which is 
why a video is there. Uh, and then I'll sign the gloss in ASL because that's the language of, that I'll be using um, and then show the video in LSM. That makes sense. Okay, interesting. So some aspects of this paper that I really like. Katie, you actually bother to explicitly argue for the existence of noun and verb classes based on internal morphological and syntactic properties of the languages that you are studying, which most people don't bother to do because they just assume that nouns and verbs exist. And you even have an operational definition of adjectives on page six, which just like never happens. And then I discovered the probable reason why you did that later on, because near the end, you reference the Rykoff paper that we used as the basis for our first episode, all about part of speech systems. And I am now super interested in this additional research question of what a signed language might look like that does not functionally distinguish between nouns and verbs, which for reference uh, is either a type 1 or a type 7 in Rykoff's part of speech hierarchy. So other typologists looking for research questions Go study more sign languages and find one that is a type 1 or a type 7 on Rykoff's hierarchy and then tell me about it, please. Yeah, I mean, presumably one exists. Yeah, I was going to say, I'd love, I'd love to hear your thoughts about medium dependence here, though, because it feels like, to me, I, you'd be more likely because of, like, the, the agreement stuff that you talk about in your paper, where, like... Uh, you have a very different pattern of agreement options in signed languages because of that 3D space effect. And it, it feels like, to me at least, I would expect a stronger distinction between nouns and verbs in signed languages because of the need to be able to use them for agreement in ways that in spoken languages you can just not bother with. So I'm curious what your thoughts are on that. Well, that's definitely one way to approach this question. Uh, you might expect that in clausal word order, with given the agreement situation that we see in most sign languages, that, yeah, you would have something that is a verb. But of course, in typology, we can't take that for granted, which is why we need to say, well, verbs re refer to events. They refer to events and they behave differently than things that refer to entities if a language has a difference. But you might expect then that there would be this really large difference between nouns and verbs. And in a lot of languages, you do have a very clear differentiation between these categories. Uh, ASL is one of them, uh, where a lot of times you get nouns derived from verbs via reduplication, which is a pretty productive process in a lot of sign languages and even a lot of spoken languages. But at the same time, you don't want to take this for granted, right? So you want to see, are the things that I see in the clause, in the sentence, the utterance, whatever you want to call it, do those things happen in smaller units, like noun phrases? Yeah, for sure. And yeah, I mean, definitely still very much in favor of not taking things for granted, <laughs> for sure. <laughs> definitely not something you can do with typology, right? If you take... No, no, indeed. If you just assume something's there, you're going to go look for it. <laughs> if you assume something isn't there, you might not notice it when it comes yep. up. Exactly. So uh, something to, important to know you know, about how this study came about is that there's really just not a lot of information about nouns and modifier word order in signed languages, not like we have for spoken languages, at least. And that's partially due to just the lack of research on signed languages in general in linguistics, uh, which has a pretty complicated history about how it came about. And one of the things that the research is really focused on is verbs. And so in this paper, I talk a lot about verb agreement, clausal word order, and how that fits in. Because we do know a lot about that in many signed languages, even sign languages that are understudied. Uh, we know a lot about whether or not they have verbs that mark subject and object. But we don't know a lot about nouns and whether properties of nouns get marked on other things like adjectives and determiners. And we don't know about the order of those things. So we know a lot about verbs and clauses. And what's interesting is that in most sign languages, you see certain word orders and not others. Uh, so within a language, you can have a lot of variation um, that can result from things like topicalization or other agreement phenomena. But the underlying word order for most sign languages is subject, object, verb, or subject, verb, object. We don't 
really see other word orders. And so that's been subject to a lot of research, a lot of questions about why that is. One of the leading hypotheses is that it's a modality effect and it's uh, due to the fact that you can mark entities in space. You can use 3D space and the grammatical system of these signed languages in a way that you can't in spoken languages. So there's been a lot of analytical effort focused towards this problem, but not so much towards nouns. And this paper started while I was taking a class at UT. I was taking a linguistic typology class and I was feeling like nouns in Mexican sign language were pretty interesting. And I was trying to make a sketch grammar of this language. And then I thought, well, I wonder how Mexican sign language compares to other sign languages. I know about ASL, but what, what about other sign languages? And so I started digging into that. I modeled my sample off of another paper that is a pretty large scale typological study, at least for signed languages. It's um, from Donna Jo Napoli and Rachel Sutton Spence. And they looked at verb agreement and word order across 42 sign languages. So this sample in this paper is 41 sign languages because the 42nd one did not have a lot of data. <laughs> Uh, published and available. Surprise. So I started to dig into this and it took about two years to get all of the data together. And there's still some gaps, but it's about as much as I could find and it's about as much as anyone who works on these languages could provide. Mm -hmm. Well, and I was surprised to see that in a couple of places, you actually managed to collect more data about the sign language sample than was available for acoustic languages. In particular, you don't have a comparison between signed and acoustic languages for quantifier order because that data is just missing in walls, which, like, that's not excusable. Walls, you need to get get on your game here. But it's also kind of not surprising because my general experience with typological literature is that quantifiers don't get as much love as they should. And so I love the fact that you even bothered <laughs> to ask that question in the first place, even if there wasn't the acoustic language data to do the proper comparison. Yeah, I mean, part of the reasoning behind that was because quantifiers and demonstratives pattern very similarly to each other. But mm -hmm. Depending on, you know, if you want to take a more theoretical approach to syntax, they are different. Yep. Uh, so I didn't want to assume anything about them patterning similarly in signed languages, although mm -hmm. that is what actually happens. I, I did appreciate the mention of floating quantifiers, which is another thing I feel like is not mentioned enough in papers on acoustic languages, even though it's definitely a thing that happens. Yeah. Yeah, and something that is a continual confounding factor in trying to figure out quantifier <laughs> word order. Yes. <laughs> because quantifiers like to move. <laughs> yep. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. We're just going to throw this in like it's like, you know, sentence level. You'll figure out what it's supposed to go to. It's <laughs> yeah. fine. We should do yeah. an episode exactly. uh, <laughs> about quantifier typology at some point because it is super interesting. We have a lot of topics to talk about, I feel like. <laughs> yes, we do. We're not going to run out of episodes anytime soon. But this is actually a, a good segue into one of the major results in the data that I noticed. It looks like sign languages in general have a lot more flexibility in nominal word order than the acoustic languages do. There are a lot more instances of either options rather than, you know, noun final or noun initial than there are in the regular acoustic spoken language sample. So I wondered if you have any thoughts about that. Yeah, so I have thoughts about that that are mostly related to sampling bias. Um, mm. So, you know, for example, in the sign language data for adjectives, we see that there's a good number of languages with adjective nouns, so, so like, you know, orange cat, uh, and a good number with noun adjectives, so something that would look like cat orange. There are also a lot of sign languages that have either, so I think about a third of the sign languages sampled used 
either word order. And this is, you know, compared to about 10% in spoken languages. This is quite a difference. But it could be that this is very well sampling artifact because we're looking at, you know, 41 sign languages compared to a thousand spoken languages in Mm -hmm. walls. On the other hand, it could not be a coincidence, right? So it could be that I categorize something as either, and it is truly the case that adjectives can go on either side of a noun. It's also possible that within a language, adjectives, some of them might be predominantly before nouns, some of them might be predominantly after nouns. So this happens in spoken languages, for example, Spanish or Italian. Um, There are certain adjectives that just tend to go before the noun and some that go after. Now, I didn't notice any that did that, but I'm not familiar with all of these languages. So I did my best in categorizing, especially when there wasn't necessarily a definitive answer about where adjectives typically go in a language. But this is something that's pretty interesting and I think is related in some ways to the amount of flexible word ordering we see in the clause with subjects, objects, and verbs. Uh, Pretty much all sign languages allow some flexibility in that. And it could be related to discursive practices or to syntactic phenomenon. It's the case that most sign languages have pretty flexible word order, where that happens in a lot of spoken languages, but there's a lot of spoken languages that don't allow that type of word order flexibility. Yeah, for sure. I would I would love to see I would love to see a study on I mean, obviously you there's more than enough work to do anyway, but like I'd love to see a study on like what does it mean? to put this adjective in front of this noun versus behind this noun? Or is it just per adjective, maybe, or whatever, like, for for a given language? Like, that was a frustration for mine in the the spoken language I was doing field work on, where you definitely had variable positioning of adjectives, and I could not tell what the difference was because I had limited data. Yeah, and you really have to look at frequency data to figure that out. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Speaking of sample bias, if we had a larger sample, there might be clearer results. Uh, Speaking of that, and speaking of uh, databases, uh, walls, um, does there exist something like walls for sign languages? It does. I would suppose it doesn't because as we said, it's pretty underrepresented, but it might might be. I'm just not familiar that much with uh, sign languages. So can you tell us about that? Maybe, maybe there's something in the works, you know? Yeah, there is actually. So uh, starting a few years ago, there was a project headed by a lot of researchers in Europe to create a sign hub. So this is a interactive website detailing typological features of signed languages, especially in particular ones. In recent years, it's been published and it's available. It's, I think, still there's a lot of work to be done to get it to the robustness that we see in walls. And some of that is work, you know, compiling the data. Another aspect of this is just work getting data in the first place from signed languages. Several of them that we know about, we don't have a lot of information about their linguistic structure. Yeah, so that's a that's a tool that's been developed in recent years, which is really nice. It's nice to have something comparable to walls, for example, especially since walls only has two maps on signed languages in it. Walls has its own problems even for spoken languages, but it's a good resource though to start with. Uh, very helpful. For sure. Certainly, if you're doing large scale things, if you, if you, in my experience, if you go and look at like an individual language, you might find some data that's just wrong. On a large scale, it's very helpful. <laughs> yeah, for general trends where the the errors get uh, get smoothed out in statistical sampling. Yeah, that reminds me of some other databases. Like for example, there is uh, the Index Phonemica and the Index mm-hmm. Diachronica, mm-hmm. which is like some phonological uh, that databases, and they are. Especially index diachronica is not very well. It's just sometimes a bit lacking, which is kind of sad. So I don't think it's something inherently wrong with databases because, like, for example, Valpel, valency patterns, some stuff about verb frames, they seem to be pretty well... Yeah, you're kind of at the whims of what's available. I think we should talk about relative clauses because relative clauses are cool. Yeah, now for something completely different. Table 8, all about... Relative clause order is one of the more extensive tables uh, in this paper, and relative clauses are cool. So could you define what all these different types of relative clauses are? Because I 
I know I had to look some of them up. I expect they will not all be familiar to all of our listeners. Yeah, yeah, of course. And uh, I also think relative clauses are pretty interesting, which is why this has become such an extensive table. (laughs) So the relative clause type that I think most people would be familiar with is uh, externally headed noun relative order. This is what we have in English. So a sentence like, I gave a book to the girl who is sitting on a bench. Who is sitting on a bench is a relative clause. And so in English, this is always after the noun. In other languages like Japanese, you might get it before the noun. So externally headed relative noun word order is not super, super common in spoken languages, but there are some very notable examples like Japanese. The other types are much less common and may or may not be in a language that someone who's listening knows. So you also get internally headed relative clauses. So these basically look like a sentence, a full clause, and it's standing in for the noun. And the noun itself is inside the relative clause. So to paraphrase how this would look in English, it might be like, Instead of, I gave a book to the girl who's sitting on the bench, it would be something like, I gave a book who the girl is sitting on the bench. Might look something like that. Related to this is correlatives. So these are also internally headed, but they're outside of the main clause. They're connected anaphorically, usually by, you know, just discursive practices A lot of languages in uh, Southeast Asia use this in their relative clause markings. So it would be something like, who the girl is sitting on the bench, I gave a book. And then that's just the practice of how you would encode this. Another way of doing this would be to have the head outside of that clause. Uh, So the relative clause itself is outside of the main clause, but the head is in the main clause. And this is generally what we call a joined. There's some conflation between correlative and adjoined categories. Some people don't really think that there is a difference, uh, but theoretically there is a difference in the location of the head and then the location of the relative clause. Another minor type is doubly headed. So you have an external head like in English, but also an internal head. And so in these languages, the head can be the same. So it could both be girl in our example from English or one could be more general than the other. So one could be just thing, and then the other head is more specific. In a minority of languages, you get some mix of this, and we call this a mixed strategy, non-dominant. That's not to say that there aren't discursive practices around what is used. One strategy might be be used for very long, prosodically heavy relative clauses. It might be used for, uh, I don't know, subjects. So there might be some language internal restrictions on how the relative clauses are used, but importantly, they occur with relatively the same frequency. So that's your possible relative clause options. Of course, you know, you could say, oh, maybe these occur equally across spoken languages, but they don't. Mm -hmm. (laughs) Like with a lot of typological patterns, you get one or two strategies that's super common and everything else is very, very uncommon. Yeah, exactly. Like with constituent order, for example, you have like SOV and SVO, which are super common. And then then everything else. Stuff like uh, V initial. Yeah, everything else, basically. Yeah. (laughs) Yeah. I I thought it was super interesting, though, that like... There are, I mean, it's only five items, so it's not like it's the most, you know, statistically uh, solid results, but that there are so many internally headed dominant signed languages in your sample. Yeah, that's eight times more common. I'm looking at walls right now, and like, of the spoken languages, it, it seems like internally headed relative clauses as your dominant strategy is almost entirely a North American aerial phenomenon. There's a few elsewhere, but almost all of the, the 60-something languages they have in this sample are in North America or 
northern South America that are doing any internally headed anything. So that's definitely interesting. That, that it seems like it is significantly more widespread in sign languages, even just based on those five items. Yeah, and what's interesting is that the use of this strategy is dispersed across what we might consider genetic families or sign languages that are historically associated with each other through the educational system, and that these sign languages are not next to each other. So we have two sign languages in East Asia that use internally headed, and then two more in the Middle East and one more in Spain. So they're really quite geographically dispersed. Yeah, which is definitely a difference from spoken language. That's really cool. Yeah. So talking about those correlations that you just mentioned, that they're, as you, as Aidan just said, geographically dispersed, are there any, you know, aerial geographical tendencies? Uh, is there anything at all? Or is it just due to the genealogical genetic factors? So if you look at this map in figure seven and you just look at the values, it might seem like there are some aerial patterns like those two sign languages in East Asia, mixed categories being used in both the US and Mexico. But what's not in this map is the genetic or historical relationships between the sign languages. And so once we start considering that, we do see some genetic patterns that begin to emerge. So in the past, a lot of studies on relative clauses really looked at mostly sign languages related to French sign language. So these would be kind of a uh, genetic cluster of languages. And those all tend to use mixed strategies. Um, so, at, you know, on just glancing at that would seem, oh, sign languages are really strange. They use mixed relative clause strategies. But then once you start to look outside that family, you see a lot more typological variation and, and similar patterns to spoken languages. You also see another tentative genetic pattern between um, Chinese sign language and Hong Kong sign language. So both of these sign languages are related through the educational system, and they both have internally headed relative clauses. What's really interesting is that none of the languages that are the spoken languages that would be ambient around these sign languages use that strategy. So it looks like it's not a contact phenomena. It's specifically because these languages are related. Right. Yeah, that would also be a really interesting research idea. I don't know how feasible it is, but just comparing the contact zones between signed languages and spoken languages, um, you know, the places where they interact, for example, you might have to correct me, but aren't there some sign uh, village sign languages where the, the entire population the entire deaf population communicate in the spoke in the sign language obviously and then all the people who actually uh, can use the spoken language they use that and additionally to that also the sign languages you know so the village sign language which has like diglossia basically yeah that's definitely a relevant question when we start looking at signed languages because they are used in this unique context of you know you have a population using a signed language you know deaf hearing depending on the community And they are surrounded by this ambient spoken language that is the majority spoken language, you know, used in a given community or in a country. And we do see impacts from spoken language in that context. So a lot of initialized signs, signs that use the manual alphabet handshape associated with the corresponding word in the spoken language. We also see some impacts on word orders. So ASL, for example, is generally noun adjective, but English is adjective noun. You do see a lot of variation based on English structure and influence from people's other languages that they know. Right. But you also see some places where there isn't this interaction, like with relative clauses. So it's definitely a question to look at, but it is a little bit harder since the spoken language is in contact. They're usually geographically adjacent to each other. This is not necessarily as easy to do when you look at spoken languages and signed languages, and then you also consider their genetic backgrounds. So it's a little bit of more of a difficult task to do on a large scale, although certainly possible and very relevant. And just for 
background purposes, is Mexican Sign Language part of the French Sign family? It is, yeah. It's related to ASL through that system, yeah. And actually, that goes back to the issue of genetic bias and also aerial bias. So we have the most information about sign languages in Europe. You can tell just by looking at this map. (laughs) But, uh, you know, so that's a problem that just has to do with how the research with sign languages and with, you know, academic resources, you know, how that has been partitioned historically. Also, coincidentally, most of these languages are related to French Sign Language, ASL, Mexican Sign Language, Brazilian Sign Language. uh, All of these are sign languages in the Americas that are related to French Sign Language. It's related to how deaf education was spread in the 1800s to other countries. A lot of the schools followed the French educational model and French Sign Language got exported that way. I feel like French Sign Language, the French Sign Language family is like the Indo-European of sign languages. And then like the British sign language family is the Uralic of sign languages. <laughs> yeah, I think that's a comparable. Yeah, I think that's a good comparison. <laughs> <laughs> those are the ones we know the most about because those are the ones that like, you know, rich people speak and have the time to talk about. Yeah, basically. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> So, and and relatedly, English and ASL have a similar status across these communities. So most deaf people know a little bit about ASL, just like how most hearing people in the world know a little bit about English. So, yep. you know, there's definitely this history within academia and outside of it that means that we know more about some languages than we do others. So let me just insert another question here that I had while uh, reading your paper. It might just be a very niche thing to ask about. Uh, uh, You mentioned non-manual markers. And I was wondering, that sounds super cool. That's so cool. Oh my god. (laughs) And I was just wondering, I had never thought of the possibility of that. And I was wondering, is that just usual sign language practice? Is it rare like comparatively or because Aidan also commented on that um, that it might be like prosody in spoken languages that it's like a super segmental layer for spoken languages and similar to that in sign languages a super manual (laughs) that I don't know I'm making words up right now another medium effect besides being able to use 3d space in sign languages is being able to do way more things simultaneously than you can do in spoken language yeah So I was wondering, is that just the default standard sign language procedure or is it special? That's a really good question. So for a long time, we've compared non-manual markers to prosody in spoken languages, and they certainly are used for some prosodic means, but they also have other functions. So they're definitely supra segmental in that they overlap with things that clearly have segments like manual signs or consonants and vowels in uh, spoken languages. But they also have some other things that they do. So there are some non-manuals that are grammatical or have been argued to be grammatical. So part of the agreement system, ASL has been argued to have head tilt and eye gaze as really important markers of subjects and objects, for example. They might also be a lexical feature used to differentiate different lexical items. But they also can be used prosodically. They often occur at prosodic boundaries or they'll spread over what we might consider a prosodic phrase. So they come up a lot in research on relative clauses. Um, Some signed languages really only seem to mark relative clauses with non-manual markers. Interestingly, those markers often involve squint, which is generally analyzed as a type of marker of shared information status or to help interlocutors bring their notice to something as not particularly salient in the conversation, but important. Kind of backgrounding. Yeah, yeah. Non-topic backgrounding. Like, hey, remember I talked about that girl while she was sitting on the bench? Something like that. And so they seem to have this varied status and whether or not they're grammatical or purely prosodic, we kind of have to look at their distribution, how frequent they are, uh, how consistently they're used. So I know for Turkish Sign Language, Okan Kubis has suggested that there are some prosodic markers of relative clauses where they tend to occur at phrase boundaries like nods or blinks, but there's also some non-manuals that are extremely consistent and seem to be maybe grammatical markers of relative clauses. 
Yeah, because that would be an interesting viewpoint、uh, to also look at. Because it just said grammatical、uh, non-manual markers, and that made me think of grammaticalization, where a non-manual marker may become grammaticalized,、mm -hmm. and that made me think of、um, diachrony. Is there something? Akin to that in sign language linguistics. I'm sorry, I'm just asking too many questions, maybe. <laughs>、uh, but is there something like diachronic analyses、uh, of sign languages? Does that even is that even viable as an option for modern day research? Yeah. So at UT Sign Lab, actually, not research that I'm personally involved in, but research from my colleagues, they've been looking at historical relationships between sign languages within the French sign language family, so ASL, Libras, Brazilian. Sign language, Mexican sign language, a few others, and so there is kind of this fledgling historical research, and we do have some research on ASL about diachronic changes because we have some very early video recordings of ASL, as well as some published dictionaries and things like that. But it's definitely a lot harder. To do this type of research than it would be for a lot of spoken languages because there isn't necessarily a writing system and there also isn't necessarily diachronic documentation of a signed language. Yeah, I'm sure we don't have a great handle on like what's a natural change versus what's an unnatural change, kind of the 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 feel that we've got for spoken language. But I did notice in your paper that there was some interesting comments on like how language families as a concept might be a little bit weird to apply to sign languages. And I was thinking about it. I was like, well, surely like there's normal language change for sign languages as much. And I was like, wait a minute, transmission of sign languages. Often works rather different than it does in spoken languages because you have it through the education system instead of parent to child. Often, yeah. So I'd love to hear what you have to say about that if you have any more. Oh, certainly, yeah. So sign languages in macro communities, so large deaf communities, typically have a more a transmission pattern that's peer to peer rather than adult to child. So you see a very different pattern there in shared sign language communities like Adam Robe sign language community used in、uh, Africa. They have kind of a more typical spoken language type pattern of transmission of adult to child, but for Most of these sign languages is peer to peer, and so you see a difference there. And then because of that, it's not the case that when these languages were emerging, deaf people came to school and they didn't know any sign. They brought their own sign systems, what they used with their family, with their friends, and their communities, and those contributed to the language that emerged later. So you have this confounding factor of it's not just the case that French sign language came to Mexico and then everyone started using it and it just became Mexican sign language. You definitely see some lexical items that are related to French sign language, but you see a lot of other differences that we really can only attribute to the native signing systems that students brought with them to the schools. So that creates this murkiness where it's really not quite right to say that these are a genetic family. It's probably better to just say they're historically associated. It's a little bit more of a, a theoretical <laughs> categorization. Yeah, because if you sit and think about it, at least in terms of like you know thinking about spoken languages, the French sign language family has expanded over the last like 150, 200 years.、Mm -hmm. Like not much more than that. That's not near enough time to get the kind of diversity that we see in it. If it was you know normal language transmission, at least of spoken languages. So clearly, there is something else going on here. Yeah, and there is that open question of how long does it take for a change to happen, <laughs> which we kind of don't really know for spoken language either. Exactly. I saw a really excellent presentation recently on historical changes in the copula cycle in ASL. Yeah, from Tori Sampson. There's a YouTube video of Tori Sampson presenting on the copula cycle in ASL at the last、uh, large sign language conference. So I actually know Tori from undergrad. So it's, it's that small of a world, <laughs> but her research is maybe one of the most in depth. Corpus studies of change in a sign language that we've had so far. That's pretty darn cool. I would like to make a note just that if we want to see this type of research continue, better 
bigger samples that don't have as many biases or issues as this one does because of its size. It's really important to include signed languages as part of regular linguistic research. And that sounds like, oh, of course, you know, but in practice, we don't really see that so much. And I think part of it is because a lot of linguists who work on typology, who work on spoken languages just in general, don't know a lot about signed languages. They don't think a lot about signed languages. And then when they teach through really no inherent fault of their own, they don't tend to teach about signed languages because it's not their area of research. And it is really hard to include this type of information. It's really hard even for me as someone who just studies signed languages almost exclusively because we don't necessarily have all the information. But we need to invest resources in this, both in the educational setting so that we can get new linguists interested in signed languages and asking questions, and then also encourage that type of research to happen in institutions so that we get better information. Because of course, if you include languages across modalities, you'll get better typology. (laughs) Yeah, especially if your goal is how do human brains work? Exactly. A lot of really useful data that gets rid of one particular bias maybe, that is is worth getting rid of if that's possible. Yeah, the modality bias would be nice if we could get that taken care of. I mean, it would be like looking at the typology of languages, but really only including Indo-European languages. You get a very different idea of how, how languages work if you do that. Yep. Mm-hmm. Yes, you do. <laughs> Theory Neutral is made possible by our listeners, families, and friends. Follow us on Twitter at theory underscore neutral, or send us an email at theory.neutral.podcast at gmail.com. Join us next time when we will be discussing the geographic distribution of language isolates. <laughs>